I meant to say that was, um, so yes, that, that's me and I'm speaking to you today, um, but I'm just the lucky one who, who got to be here today. And actually the projects that I'll present to you are a huge collaborative effort. And so you can see a range of co-authors here on the, on the first slide who have helped pull these slides together, get this talk ready. Um, but actually it's, it's a huge group and a um, huge range of people who um, work on these projects and apologies if I've missed anyone in this big list. So, um, I'm not changing the right. so, what I'll talk to you today about is um, some of the drivers behind plant conservation, why we need to conserve plants and the role of botanic gardens in this kind of work. So the ex situ conservation work that we do and the research that we do. And I'll give you some examples of um, partnership projects. So the mountain plants was already mentioned. And another example I um, was asked to speak about is myrtle rust. So um, science, scientists have told us that we are um, currently th living through Earth's sixth mass extinction event. I must admit that that um, paper focuses on, on megafauna rather than plants, but really applies to a lot of biodiversity. And we are losing a lot of plants. And I don't need to convince this audience, obviously, that plants are really important um, and they're really important to our daily lives. <coughs> Um, sadly, in Australia, we've already um, got about 5% of our native species threatened with extinction. That's probably an underestimate. That's based on the federal listing. There's also state and territory lists that add, would add more species. And a lot of species that are in decline but maybe not yet listed, even though they might meet the criteria. And so there's some really common drivers behind this loss. Um, we have habitat loss climate change and introduced species really commonly occurring um, when looking at threatened species. So there are thankfully a few things we can do. We have a little conservation toolkit we can use. We can protect plants in, um, in the wild, in, na in situ, in nature reserves. We can undertake projects where we improve connectivity between fragmented reserves or um, do ecosystem restoration in really degraded sites. And we have ex situ conservation methods up our sleeve, so taking plants out of their natural range and moving them into um, safe or alternative sites. And um, for us in gardens, this means things like plants in gardens or nursery holdings, seed bank collections, and germplasm, um, either tissue culture or cryo storage of plant tissues. And an additional point that I'd like to make there is that these collections also are really useful su for supporting different kinds of plant biology research and um, providing horticultural and propagation information, all of which can lead back to or support these other um, conservation and management options that we have. So we can learn things about the plants and their climate tolerance that can help inform how they're managed in nature reserves, or we can um, uncover new propagation methods that are used to um, produce plants for those connectivity or restoration projects. And so to go sort of into a bit more detail, um, I'll talk to you about these couple of example projects. So the first one is the Tropical Mountain Plant Science Project, hashtag TROMPS for anybody who's a social media person, not me. <laughs> um, so this is a project that is being led by the Australian Tropical Herbarium with support from the Ian Potter Foundation and the Wet Tropics Management Authority. And there are a range of botanic gardens who are partners in this project. And so in the map here, on the left, you can see, oh sorry, yes, your left, you can see um, the wet tropics in the very far northern um, tip of Queensland. And when you zoom in, uh, you can see seven sort of mountaintop areas uh, shown on the map there. And these are really um, notable for the flora that occur there, occurs there. So above about 900, 1,000 metres, we get a range of mountaintop endemic plants. So they're only in these wet tropics areas. The annual rainfall is about almost two metres, and um, these plants only occur on those seven um, mountain tops or mountain regions. And these are just a couple of the endemic species that you can find there. And so uh, colleagues at the Tropical Herbarium went through a uh, species distribution modelling project where they looked at how those mountaintop endemic plants might be uh, affected by climate change. And they looked at 19 species where enough data were available to do the climate modelling. And you can see, oh, I'm pressing the wrong slides. Uh, you can see here on the map the results that they found. So this is the wet tropics region and you can see species richness. The red colour is the, the richest areas in the mountains. 
for, for those mountaintop endemics. And the red is 9 to 15 uh, taxa. And over time, you can see that those uh, areas where those plants occur are, are going to be lost. The climate will change. So the researchers knew that um, <laughs> knew that the the kind of rarity and low occurrence of these species meant that um, with better, more records or more occurrence data, the models might change a little. So this launched uh, months of fieldwork of new surveys to improve the occur number of um, records. And through that work, they were able to improve the data for the 19 species they had worked on, but also collect enough distribution information for another 18 species. So new models were run and um, went into much more detail or, or more species. And sadly, again, uh, the results were somewhat alarming and those uh, sites were lost. So um, even with this extra information, it was still a similar pattern those sites were um, going to be lost to climate change. And for seven species, their habitat was looking like it would be completely lost. And for six of those seven, that's going to happen by 2035, according to this modelling. So there's a real time urgency here to conserve some of the species. So we're a planty group, so I'll show you what some of the species are, rather than just talking in numbers. Um, this Leptospermum was one of my personal favourites. I was lucky enough to go along on the first trip to Mount Lewis. And you can see in the photo on the, uh, at the bottom of the slide there from Rhododendron Rock, uh, looking out at the canopy and the sort of rusty colour, wrong button, rusty coloured leaves there are the Leptospermum um, sitting up in the, in the clouds there. And this only occurs on a couple of those rocky um, sites. And it's actually a bit of a dominant canopy species on the mountaintops around the rocky outcrops. And it's got an important ecological role too. Um, this species, along with the rest of the canopy species, intercept a lot of moisture from the clouds. And research that's been done shows something like 60% of the moisture in the dry season is, is coming from the cloud stripping that these canopy plants do. So um, important role in the system. We have other really um, striking species, quite um, notable species like Dracophyllum as well. This is a um, shrub to tree. Again, it sort of occurs in these more exposed sites, so in a particular kind of rainforest that's sort of low and windswept. And um, this one is a source of food for nectar feeding animals as well. So um, a, again, another endemic species that's also playing a, a role in the ecosystem. One of my personal favourites that just really caught my eye um, out, of, out of the car window was this Lambrassia. At the time, I was sort of um, kicking myself for my poor botanical knowledge, looking at this thing going, what is it? I can't even think of a genus. Turns out it's a monotypic genus, so I let myself off the hook a little bit. <laughs> it's the only Lambrassia in the world and just occurs on these two mountains um, between 800 and 1200 metres and something that grows in, in wetter areas. So that's just a few of the species. There are so many more. I could give a whole talk just on the mountaintop endemics, I think. Uh, for those of you who like names, that's the names of the ones you can see in the photo there. And so that's just a bit of an introduction to some of the species. But needless to say, um, all of this previous modelling and um, endemicity and, and rarity of some of the species has led to this new TROMPS project. So you can see a bit of a project plan up on the right there which takes the previous uh, modelling inf information that was available and came up with this um, proposal that we put to Ian Potter Foundation to go out, collect from across the range of these species to secure plants ex situ and also to do a, a range of activities. So there's seed banking research, there's plant propagation, genetic analyses and also some climate tolerance research to try and understand whether these species might actually be a bit more um, flexible than we think. And so today I'll focus mostly on the um, on the propagation side of things. So going out and collecting, propagating those samples, and then aiming to set up distributed collections across the range of botanic gardens to secure that material. And one of the reasons um, I'll focus on cuttings is not only that that's happening right now when those samples are, are being collected and just freshly have come in um, last week from Warren's trip. Um, but also because we, we kind of are in a bit of a situation where we need to use both cuttings and seeds and rely on the cuttings a little bit because at the moment there's 
not really any information on seed and its storage behaviour, whether it can be banked or its dormancy and germination. And a lot of these plants are known to only produce small amounts of seed, uh, so maybe irregularly, and often that's during the wet season where access is really restricted. Most of the roads to these mountain tops are closed and it's quite dangerous to, to go out there. So to give you a little bit more detail about the field collecting, um, some of the aims are to collect as many individuals as we can from a populational site and take those um, from as far sort of dis uh, plants that are spaced a little bit across the site. And where species occur on more than one mountain top, collect from the multiple mountain tops as well. And so the, given the different activities happening within the project, the different kinds of work, there's a lot of uh, material types being collected. So the team are collecting herbarium vouchers, they're taking those cuttings for propagation, sometimes seedlings if cuttings aren't um, likely to succeed. Where we can find seeds, we're collecting those and we will use them for the um, seed research. And also DNA samples are being collected for the genetic analyses. And so the different partners in the project are, are, are working through different roles. So the vouchers are processed by the Australian Tropical Herbarium, or for those who speak herbarium speak, CNS, CANS. Um, and the cuttings are being processed by um, us in Canberra, AMBG, and the Victorian Garden, particularly the Cranbourne Nursery. And seed processing is all happening at the plant bank in New South Wales. And so really... Um, critical part of processing all of this material and, and doing it in this distributed way is maintaining the links back to the original field records. So by being able to tie um, or track a plant in a pot back to where it came from and sometimes even the plant that it came from out, out on a mountain top, uh, we really gain a lot in the information that we have about that plant, but also in being able to keep some track of the genetic diversity that we might have captured. So sometimes cutting methods are criticised for being um, for capturing less genetic diversity than seed collections. But if they're done the way that they're being done here, and if we know whether every um, maternal plant has succeeded or most have succeeded, particularly in a case like this where there's not much seed around, we can actually do better with, with the cutting methods than we might do with seed, potentially. Uh, and a second really important output to come from this is the propagation methods and those records. So the horticulturists are doing a great job keeping track of all the things that they try, what's worked, and also some other information like how long it takes for the cuttings to strike, so that that can be shared around with others who might want to um, propagate these in future. And eventually we're looking to distribute the plants. So the original proposal has the... Um, partners who are involved and the, as I explained, the material comes down to um, Canberra and Melbourne, the arrow sort of is a bit off centre. Uh, propagation happens and then material will go back out to uh, various botanic gardens. And we'll do that as this backup. So this is about trying to secure these things ex situ, conserve them in backup populations away from that um, climate danger that they're in in the wild because some of the gardens, particularly the ones that are high altitude and cooler climate, uh, or a similar match to where the plants are occurring now. Um, but we also can learn a lot. This is basically also a distributed experiment where we can see things like the leptospermum in cloud forests in the wild and um, think that maybe that's the only habitat that it's going to work in or grow in. And actually, um, when some of the Cairns folks visited in, in Canberra, they were amazed to see this really mature leptospermum in cultivation in Canberra, nothing like the two metres of rain and, and cloud that it's used to, but, but doing well and flowering and fruiting. So we can learn a lot from this distribution and, and growing these plants in different climates and see whether they are maybe a little bit more plastic or able to adapt in, in ways that we didn't predict. So, I think I skipped too many there. Uh, so, for the Victorian um, side of the project, the uh, Victorian Gardens have signed an MOU with James Cook University and they're now locked in to, by 2023, uh, having living collections of these endemic mountaintop species. And there's some locations already identified in Melbourne and Cranbourne where these plants might be grown long term. So far, there's been uh, three expeditions that Victorian staff have participated in. And Warren, I don't know where he's sitting, but he's the one to talk to if you want to know more about that. And uh, numbers have just come in from the third trip last week, so this is a really rough count, but it seems like about 50% of the potential 80 species that we're um, aiming to collect over the project are already secured in, in 
um, collections, or at least in propagation. We, don't, we won't know the success of some of the propagation for a, a while yet, but a fair number of the target species are, are going okay. And so for the regional botanic gardens in Victoria, um, there's opportunity here to distribute plant material to those who are interested and, and beyond Victoria as well. Others like South Australia, Tasmania and other gardens might also be interested. Uh, the Dandenong Ranges are already part of the, the initial um, project group, but there's a plan to open expressions of interest for other gardens who might like to take some of these species and, and grow them in their collections. So an expression of interest will be advertised through the Big Anne's email alert uh, sometime later in 2019. So keep an eye on your email inbox if you would like to take and home some of these plants. So for the TROMPS project, uh, I think something that I really enjoy is the way that a diversity of partners and expertise have been brought together. We've got scientists, horticulturalists, botanists, uh, e everyone working together to create as um, Diverse as, possible, uh, diverse as possible ex situ collections to try and secure these species and do that in a distributed way across a lot of gardens and, and manage that risk across um, the country. And from these collections we can do research to better understand the species. So, next is a complete change <laughs> from <laughs> Tromps. Um, <laughs> we're going from a, a project that's up and running to a broader program that's being investigated and envisaged by the uh, Myrtle Rust community of concern. So Bob's really the driver behind uh, a lot of what I'll present here. And um, this is about bringing together a, a program to do what we can to combat Myrtle Rust. So Myrtle Rust, for those who don't know, is a um, pathogenic fungal disease that has come from South America. And it arrived in Australia in 2010. And it's very rapidly spread along the east coast from Tasmania right up to um, Cape York and across into uh, the Northern Territory. And so um, because it spreads by spores, it's very readily um, dispersing and spreading and, and probably likely to cover more of Australia. There's a bunch of modelling that's been done um, that shows a general pattern of more of the east coast and possibly some of Western Australia being impacted. So we know already from observations of infection that 358 native species are susceptible to myrtle rust. And um, although it's a global problem, our Australasian myrtaceae seem to be uh, naive to this disease. So we, we seem to have a lot of um, susceptible species that are rapidly declining. And so what the disease does is impact new foliage, distort growth, reduce flowering and fruiting, and if enough growth is impacted, eventually the plants basically starve and die. And so Bob really wanted me to emphasise that at the moment there's not a nationally coordinated or funded response and it would be really nice to, ha to have one. Uh, but in the meantime there's been some good um, review work of uh, the, s the size of the impact and, and the environmental impact so far as well as a draft action plan that's been prepared. So the action plan takes um, all of the known susceptible species and identify some priority groups. And there's one um, group that's top of the list that's the emergency category. And I'll show you a couple of those species. So uh, it's a group of only four species, thankfully, <laughs> um, not, although it might grow. Uh, so Rhodomatis is one of those. You can see where its natural distribution is. And we know from records that it's um, something that appears common prior to myrtle rust arriving and it's a plant that has a generation time of 12 to 20 years. That was then, this is now. It's been categorised as extremely susceptible. All of the plant parts are infected. Uh, regeneration seems to be impacted as well. And in New South Wales at least, from 18 sites that were surveyed, mortality was seen in 15 of those sites. Not every tree, but mortality of some trees. And the estimates done on the New South Wales populations suggest that um, an 80% reduction in population size might be seen within one generation. So New South Wales have now listed this as critically endangered based on that assessment. Uh, similarly, there's Rhodamnia rubescens. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, Rhodamnia. <laughs> I went to that one. Uh, which is another rainforest plant and, uh, again, was once common. And this one lives about 30 to 40 years. Now what we see is, uh, again, highly susceptible, all the plant parts infected, many populations uh, with mortality, and actually quite a lot of those 100% mortality. 
no evidence of regeneration surviving and again another species that's now critically endangered at least in New South Wales listing um, process. So uh, some of the actions that are being taken already by botanic gardens and seed banks are um, first of all helping with the records of the species that are susceptible so observing infections in gardens and making records of those so that that list can be maintained but also um, taking stock of any materials that we already have of these priority species in our living collections or seed bank collections and then going out and securing new material while we can in some cases um, for those populations that are declining rapidly. So there's a few example projects around. There's uh, a somewhat pending New South Wales Government Saving Our Species program which Bob is um, working on at the moment and they're looking at declining the three critically endangered species and making uh, emergency collections of germplasm. Uh, Boudere National Park, you can see uh, Steve here collecting the rhodamnia that occurs uh, locally, the populations that are local to Boudere, and securing those in their living collection. Uh, the Plant Bank have been doing some great research, not just on securing material, but then investigating the best way to store and grow that material. So I'll show you a bit more about that. Uh, and also there's some work I'm aware of through the Threatened Species Research Hub where our database is being curated, but I think it's a bit more of a focus on Queensland species. So Karen's work uh, at the Plant Bank has looked at those two species, the Rhodamnia and the um, uh, Rhodomyrtus, and gone through these options that we have in garden ex situ conservation of growing plants in gardens, banking seeds and putting germplasm into culture. And they've worked through these procedures to see which ones um, are, are useful for conserving these species. So semi-hardwood cuttings have been successful, although the success really varies with uh, the level of infection of the source material. So much greater success if the material is not already infected. Um, for seed banking, one of the species, the seeds have been confirmed as orthodox, which means we can dry and freeze and store them in the usual seed bank way, which is kind of good news. But the bad news is that it's been really difficult to source enough viable seed from either species to do that classification, let alone store the seeds. So only just last week they've managed to collect from cultivated Renomertus enough seed to, to do this same assessment. And so for both species, we might be able to bank the seeds, but um, we're going to really struggle to get enough viable seed for the 10,000 we'd ideally like in a good seed bank collection. So seed orchards are something that we're very likely to require. And for tissue culture, that's been a successful method. Um, both of the species can be initiated into tissue culture. And for the uh, Rhodamnia, it, uh, you can see on the bottom uh, left, it can be um, potted on and grown, and that's a really nice looking specimen growing in the um, Mount Annan Gardens. Um, and for the Rhodomertus, you can see a cutting example on the right there. So overall, this means we've got some options for these species. Um, to put them into ex situ conservation. And uh, this is also a really good foundation and building block for future uh, programs like seed orchards and breeding and resistance programs if, if we choose to go down that path. But it is going to be something that takes a lot of coordination and, and work. Uh, so anyway, in the meantime, botanic gardens can be canaries in the coal mine. We can report what we observe and infections we observe. We can continue to lead by example and secure the species close to us and do what we can to save those. In the meantime, um, there are some opportunities with these projects that are already underway for gardens to uh, take on these dispersed live holdings of plants. So there's those emergency taxa from New South Wales, and there's also a couple of additional species. Oh, I haven't changed slide. Also, a couple of additional species um, listed just there that Plant Bank have also been working on uh, with Queensland folks. And on the Victorian side, we know that. Um, there's opportunities again to host these um, satellite populations and I'm not sure where Owen is in the audience but uh, I believe the Gondwana Garden at Cranbourne has been flagged as a potential site where uh, um, some of these plants could go. And again, a similar EOI process to the chomps could, could be a really good way of, of sharing some of this material. So um, at the moment we're kind of in almost a triage emergency response mode um, but hopefully in the longer term we can look at all the priority species and coordinate in a way where um, we all come together um, to, to do this sort of work under a broader strategic plan and there's a lot of future option um, 
like the seed production and um, research and breeding programs that we could um, go down that path. But in the meantime, if you would like more information, or particularly if you want to register any interest, please do contact Bob Makinson. His um, email is, is there if you would like to jot it down. He's very happy to be a linkage point and information broker and help you find what you need to find, um, so much so that he's given us his personal email there, so use it. <laughs> uh, or contact your BGANS member. And if you want to read more about Myrtle Rust, these are the documents to go and find. They're freely available on the Australian Network for Plant Conservation website and um, summarise a lot of information that's otherwise only um, available through paid for journal articles. Uh, those documents. <laughs> so, right, I think I'm on time nearly and we'll just go over a little to summarise overall. So, um, sadly, plants are facing a lot of threats, things like climate change and myrtle rust. Uh, but thankfully, I think botanic gardens can offer a, a bit of hope here and, and we can help to conserve some of these species in our collections. And we've heard a lot today about the fact that our collections might be at risk from climate change, but also we've got some different climates where um, species that are being impacted in the wild might also do okay in our botanic gardens. And so I guess one of the um, main things to come out of these partnership projects is that the plants don't know any borders and it seems to work really well when the botanic gardens and, and um, different states and territories and, and regions can work together and also cross those borders. And we can spread the risk by distributing our collections. We can create these distributed experiments to learn more about the plant's abilities and their tolerance and resistance. And by bringing all that um, partnership but also expertise together, we can achieve some really good outcomes. And so the very last thing I'll say is that, and this is maybe a bit more my personal view, they're more than just collections. We're not just securing this stuff, having it safely locked away. They're also there um, to be used in other ways. They enable research that can help in our um, conservation mission, and particularly when they're collected in a, in a um, well-documented uh, way. And uh, we can learn a lot about the plants, but also, um, for our own purposes, how to propagate or grow them. And even just the simple thing of less visitation and sampling for the wild populations if we can sample from our botanic gardens populations rather than keeping on um, visiting the, the natural populations. And finally, there's also some really good opportunities here for community engagement. Botanic gardens can be a really good shop front for conservation. We can foster this sort of ongoing <coughs> community support for these conservation activities if we can communicate that to our visitors. Uh, and, and we can sort of share that story about some of this common good stuff that we do that benefits all Australians. So thank you again to the many, many organisations and people and thank you to all of you for listening and for the opportunity to speak. <laughs>